Good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us today. And thank you, Kemba, for coming and uh, doing the State of the Net with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure to do this. I know you said you told me back there that uh, you've actually done one of these before a while ago, but yeah. it's great to have you in your new official capacity. So um, the uh, I, I wanted to start. Um, there's been a lot of talk on about the, the national strategy. In fact, uh, CyberScoop, when it, when it came out, it said, it's here. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it, it, it did come out to a lot of fanfare and there's a lot of excitement about it. Tell me what you're most excited about them in, in the strategy. You know, it, it felt kind of like when we released it Thursday, it felt like National Cyber Day, like National Cyber Prom Day. Um, I'm really excited about it because it's really forward leaning. I think it is practical. Um, it addresses a lot of the, the, some of the issues we've been talking about time and time again over decades, but takes a new approach to it. So there are two primary approaches that are new. We're taking a positive view of the internet such that we're thinking about ways to lift and shift cybersecurity risk away from the end user and to those that can bear it and buy it down. And we're thinking of tools for adding resilience so that when there is downtime, uptime is swift and seamless. How do we do that? What are the investments we need to make to do that? Not just in the technology, but in the people and in the rules and responsibility that create cyberspace. So it's really a positive look. It's how do we make what we have defensible and then how do we make it resilient in a way that doesn't allow China, North Korea, Iran, et cetera, to set our agenda. We're not just playing whack-a-mole this time. For those of us that have been in this game for a while, um, we know what, how, to, how to respond, right? We know that information sharing is important. We know that we have to defend what we have. But how do we make the right investments? What do we, how do we make this durable? What do we need to change in order to, like I said, have a positive vision of the internet? Well, one of the things that has caught most people's attention is, you know, it starts off with regulation. Yeah. And um, I, I just wanted to get kind of your view on that balance between regulation and innovation and where we stand and how we keep security. I mean, the U.S. has led on yeah. cybersecurity forever since the beginning of cybersecurity, so, you know. Uh, and uh, how do we keep that moving forward in that way and at the same time get to the point where we need to get to, as you were saying, uh, and, and get, get that balance right? Yeah, so regulation is one of the tools in the strategy that we point to, but it's in pillar one, as you noted. Um, so we need to figure out a way to incentivize the proper cybersecurity investments. So one of the tools that we talk about in the strategy is leaning in a bit on regulation but not just regulating for the sake of regulating, making sure that it's targeted and focused on cybersecurity, raising that cybersecurity baseline for some industries, harmonizing um, what's required for other industries, right? So I've heard from industry, some sectors have, I don't know, 150 or so reporting requirements or, or compliance regimes all around one thing, right? How do we harmonize it so that we can then invest in whatever the capital expenditures are for ensuring durable security, right? So harmonizing, regulating where things might not have been regulated before to really cause an even playing field so that we begin to reward those that seriously invest in cybersecurity. Um, some of the other tools that, that are in there acknowledge that we, I mean, America's led in R&D in so many spaces in so many ways we need to think about how to creatively leverage that innovative thought, that innovative process. So cyber uh, priorities and R&D is called for in, in the strategy, right? To, to really spark innovation in this space. If we get to a place where instead of having a first to market sort of regime, we have a secure to market regime my hope is that we spark innovation for security, building security in to some of our technology, focusing on security and our people's skills, and really thinking about the roles and responsibilities. But we wanna get to a place where we have secure to market, more so than first to market. So security is uplifted in this space. Well, I, I do wanna just in general congratulate you on, uh, on the strategy. I think uh, it is, the best of the strategies, the cyber strategies, and I think it will be a model for the world. 
And um, it was created by the, your office, the Office yeah. of the National Cyber Director, um, which is a relatively new office. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, where, where, what do you think about how the office is growing and how, um, where, it's, where it's headed and where do you plan to take it while you're at? Well, thank you. First of all, that it, 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 I'm proud of the strategy. You would you would have thought that I was personally responsible for writing every word, and I wasn't, right? Um, but I'm proud of it. So the you got it out the door. I got out the door. Absolutely. Um, but the National Cyber Director's Office really took it to heart when we were given the responsibility for creating the President's National Cybersecurity Strategy, and it is just that it is a national cybersecurity strategy. So it's not an ONCD strategy. We had um, hundreds of stakeholders provide input, table reads. Not all of them agree with us, but all of them understand it. Uh, it's it's coherent. Um, it reflects every part of the cybersecurity community. So large enterprises, not for profits, civil society, academia, etc. It is a national cybersecurity strategy. All the departments and agencies were involved in this process. So that, that's one of the reasons why, in my view, we have a really balanced, forward-looming, bold strategy, because we really took to heart, how are we going to make this work, right? So the hard part begins. You have this implementation part now that we, we're leaning into. We are trying to craft our implementation plan now because we want these things to work. Some of these are going to be multi-year ventures. They're going to involve everybody that we uh, engaged in the strategy building process and even more engaged in implementation. It's a whole of government, whole of society activity. Um, about the office growth, we have, uh, we, we have just two years old. We're toddlers, believe it or not. Um, we, so I, I used to be a musician. I don't play anymore, but I think of this as a symphony, right? So you've seen the first three movements. You stood up the office, we've got great people, We've launched the national cyber strategy. That is like Beethoven's fifth, right? Um, but we have the implementation plan to do. That's another movement. We have the workforce strategy, that workforce awareness and education strategy. That's in, where, where we have the APIs built in to this strategy. That's another movement. So we're building this symphony in order to make progress in cybersecurity and, and ultimately achieve those two fundamental principles, shifting risk and building resilience. So, I mean, Chris English sold you on uh, to become the yeah. principal deputy <laughs> and to take over for him. Yeah. And just curious, like, how, how you see, um, you know, what he sold you on originally, yeah. the vision, and what it is today and what you want it to be and kind of how that, you, you see that moving along, too. Yeah. So, true fact, the day after Russia invaded Ukraine is when Chris approached me about being his second in command. So, and and prior to that moment, I hadn't actually worked with Chris on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, I knew who he was. I knew his body of work. He knew my body of work. But the thing that um, really sold me on this was he saw an opportunity for me to have value in cybersecurity, in this cyberspace, right? So I've done it in the nonprofit world. I've done it in private sector. I've done it as a federal civilian employee. And this is from a different vantage point now. He valued the type of experience that I was bringing into the into the position. He and I are like apples and oranges, right? We're just different. Maybe not even apples and oranges, like apples and, and broccoli, right? Um, he's an engineer three times over. I'm a lawyer in all sorts of ways. We had different experiences. We're able to bring different um, problems, solutions to problems, and get to the same place but it was better than either one of us could have imagined. That was a, a fantastic partnership. And the staff is built out the same way, right? So not everybody on staff are engineers. We clearly have some fantastic engineers, but we have strategists. We have those that come from the non nonprofit. We have a, um, a, a, a defense attorney that has done a lot of trial work in our, all right? We have a lot of talent, a lot of skills that really allows us to leverage the strength of the office uh, and and cause good things to happen. One of our superpowers, uh, one of the things that the geek in me really, um, <laughs> really leaned into, is that we have this enormous power in the statute to align 
budgets, cy align cyber priorities and budgets across an agency. That's a superpower that I really like because nothing works if you're not resourced properly. I mean, what a novel concept. So, so we're positioned to really be um, forward leaning and find practical solutions to some of these problems. That's really great. But one of the things you, you talked about the, the first day you were yeah. uh, asked when you were asked to come in, uh, uh, it was the Ru Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. And you've talked to quite a lot about the fact that um, the, the U.S. government has handled how they work with the private sector yeah. on that issue and the operational collaboration on it, it truly making it a public-private partnership different than it has been done in the past. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more for this audience, which may not have heard some of those details. Yeah. So, and, and how do we keep that going? So one of the things that was so outstanding to me was the fact that we finally figured out a way to take classified information and get it to those that are going to be able to action it in a, in a realistic way. So, for example, uh, in Ukraine, we, were, we knew that we were going to sanction certain, certain elements of the Russian government, and we we thought about how that might impact our critical infrastructure at home. Maybe something might happen to the financial sector. We were able to take classified information and get it to the financial sector who was able to operate, operationalize it, right? And so we were able to protect ourselves at home. That's a new way of collaboration. That's operational, that's professional intimacy. I think you've heard me say before. It's not just information sharing, we've evolved. Uh, and the, the aggression of Russia against Ukraine has helped us get there. So we've taken that, felt like that was a pivotal moment, and we've really leaned into it. So we've used our convening power in the White House, for example, to bring in C-suite um, members, stakeholder members, right? So like the electrical vehicle market, the health, energy, and others. Um, we brought them in given them threat briefings, sometimes threat and vulnerability briefings, and one day classified read-ins to give them information that they can operationalize, that they can imagine having a capital expenditure to address, not just an operational expenditure, but capital. That's why it was important that we had CEOs, COOs in these rooms, and then had a, a public conversation, an unclassified conversation among um, industry leaders and government leaders about what we can do to operationalize opportunities together, given the threat briefing. The JCDC does it in a different way than what we've done, but it's also effective. And NSA's uh, C does it in its own way. It's a one-on-one -on -one type of opportunity, but the, the bottom line is we have opportunities now to operationally identify uh, problems and then figure out ways to to address those problems together, right? So we have better, we have one plus one equals three. We have geometric outcomes from that kind of collaboration. That's new. I mean, at least I left government for three years or something and came back and found, pleasantly found a new way of public-private partnership. And how do you make sure that you're not overlapping with what JCDC is doing or what uh, the, the NSA is doing? You know, I think overlap is not a bad thing, I'm, honestly. I, there might be situations where if you are a part of the DIV, the defense industrial base, and you want a one-to-one -one, uh, opportunity to, to collaborate with NSA as the DIB, that's the right place to do it. If you are trying to figure out the log4j problem and you need an all of community approach and you wanna feed into that process, that's the right way to do it within JCDC. There, there isn't, um, a mutually exclusive way to do it. We, we in the government have figured out we need to meet our stakeholders, our constituents where they are. We have a duty to provide a platform, whatever that platform may be, for industry to be able to collaborate. That's, a, that's what's important. That's what's fresh. We worry about on the back end how we share amongst ourselves. That should not be a problem for industry to figure out. That's, that's my problem. Um, but we, we owe it to have a variety of platforms to meet industry and, and civil society where they are, however they want to share with us. Um, I know you have to get back to the to event in White House. We have one last question for you, which, I mean, it's a topic that has come up at this forum and at I, I, the Internet Education Foundation forums for many, many years is the workforce problem. You yeah. talked about it a little bit. 
you know, uh, and and you're I know uh, you're working on the strategy, and then and the uh, national cyber strategy says we're building a strategy for the workforce. <laughs> Look at that one. Uh, what, can you preview a little bit about where it's going and how it's going to work, and what's going to be different this time? Like, what, how are we going to make progress on this issue? It seems somewhat interminable, uh, you know, looking back yeah. on, on the growth here. So we, we're taking the all many few approach. You might have heard this before, right? We're addressing not just the cyber and IT jobs uh, that exist, but those that implicate cyber around it. So policymakers, lawyers, assembly factory workers, uh, and then the pipeline, the many, the all, right? How do we deal with K through 12? How do we deal with reskilling and upskilling? Um, as we build out broadband, for example, as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law, how do we think about workforce as we build that out to make sure not only that our uh, broadband is secure, but that we are also offering opportunities for good paying jobs in cyber? There are a couple of things that come to mind um, that you'll see in the strategy eventually. One is that we have to, this, we have to help communities understand that cyber is not necessarily always technical. There are important technical jobs out there, but that it, there really is a place for any skill set to be in cyber. That's, that's one piece. Um, the other is how do we build out curricula for K through 12, for community colleges, for universities? Um, how do we build that in? How do we build in um, workforce, for example, in Chi Chips and Science Act, as we near shore, onshore chip manufacturing, fab, fabs uh, centers. How do we do that? Um, and then the last piece is, what are the barriers that we're imposing on ourselves and on and our cybersecurity community? Do we really need CISS piece for every job? Do we need to have expensive certifications? Maybe we do, but have we thought about it? Have we thought about, do we need that or do we need a certain set of skills? Do we need a college degree? Or do we need vocational programs to help implicate this, right? So we're really challenging ourselves to figure out what barriers have we put up in the cybersecurity community that's causing part of the problem. And, and what should uh, folks here in the private sector and you know uh, others uh, who want to engage in the uh, workforce strategy, how, what should they be looking for and how can they engage? So we have, we did have an RFI recently. This is not our only uh, opportunity to engage with the private sector. We are also bringing, pulling and bringing in uh, small communities the same way we did with the National Cybersecurity Strategy, getting into communities at every level, getting into the stakeholder space at every level to be a part of the, the process of building the strategy. Um, but even on a practical matter, the Department of Labor has recommitted additional money, for example, to have registered apprenticeships in cyber. Industry could participate in those registered apprenticeships. And so one of those opportunities where there's an actual thing you can do now to address the issue um, as we're building out the strategy. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Really appreciate it. And best of luck to you. Thank you, Ari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.